Um, it's a real privilege to be here with uh, scholars and producers of a whole range of different kinds of publications. Um, so I look forward to furthering the conversations that we may have uh, during the tea breaks and, and over lunch as, as well. Um, I wanted to say, thank you very much, um, that my first proper introduction to the process of duplication was not through the ditto, the mimeograph machines that produced the printed ephemera of fan publications, protest pamphlets, sci-fi or community newsletters, rather through the work of the American industrial designer, Raymond Lowy. As an undergraduate at the University of Texas, I became fascinated with the history of 1930s design. Um, Lowy, along with Norman Bel Geddes, Henry Dreyfus, and Walter Doran Teague, were part of a new generation of designers who were actively involved in restyling consumer and industrial products. The result was a new kind of machine aesthetic based on speed, efficiency, simplicity, and cleanliness, or at least the perception thereof. And I'm going to defer to our specialist in the audience on this as well. There we go. Thank you. Now, Raymond Lowy established a long-standing client relationship with Gestetner, the founder of the duplicating machine. In 1929, he was asked to redesign what became known as, I believe, the Model 66. Lowy created a black casing or shell to hide the internal mechanics of the machine to improve the duplicator to be efficient, easier to clean, safer to operate, and embodying a quieter mode of production. The new version of the machine increased the sales for the company, or at least we're told. The Gestetner duplicator's restyling reflects what the historian Donald Bush describes as a general cultural phenomenon of the 20th century, the desire to perform actions efficiently, quickly, and without disruption. Now, in the 1930s, the duplicator offered a new kind of autographic printing technology. With Gestetner's efficiency and cheaper production processes, the duplicator was adopted by left-wing radical groups, political activists, and dissidents, as well as artists. One historian writes that the mimeograph became the ideal medium for fostering freedom of expression and ideas, and that it was lightweight, compact, thereby avoiding confiscation and censorship. This personal printer was operating outside of mainstream print infrastructures. Its messy ink smeared out and out of register images and easily corrupted stencils resulted in a language of graphic ephemera best described as quick and dirty or crude aesthetic. And these are other people's descriptions. I'm not sure I completely agree with that. But anyway, this quick and dirty aesthetic, which I'd like to explore further in relationship to the products of alternative printing practices, and in particular through the productions of fanzines, and as we've heard already today, a term which is a compilation of fan and magazines, reflecting the do-it-yourself ethos, which is distributed and shared amongst like-minded individuals. The process of duplication provided cheaply produced small print runs for fanzine producers and often yielded a specific visual aesthetic, encouraged by the technological constraints and the peculiarities found in the process of the Gestertner mimeograph machine and the accompanying uh, typewriter stencils, handmade typography, and drawings. Its form cannot be removed from its function. Fanzines rallied against the conventions of mainstream publishing, while at the same time drawing the visual inspiration through a critique of the social, cultural, economic, and political times in which they were produced. As one writer comments, a new visual language grew out of the language-obsessed mimeozines. For the purposes of the talk today, I will focus on two examples of mimeographed comic zines from the late 1960s and a photocopied punk fanzine produced in 1976, specifically that of Ripped and Torn by Tony Drayton, so that we might explore the following questions. What is duplication and what is being duplicated? And in a way, what I uh, will come to read next is a series of musings on uh, some of these ideas in relationship to the comic zines and the, and the punk fanzine. Duplication is defined by the Cambridge Dictionary as the act or process of making an exact copy of something. To duplicate means to make an identical copy of something. The Gestetner was the forerunner for office photocopiers and later laser printers, which made accessible and affordable small print runs. 
Whilst the duplicator or mimeograph machine provided a process for repeating the production of printed ephemera, early fanzines were not necessarily sustainable as identical copies. The nature of the process was fraught with inks blurring, unable to hold crisp graphic marks. As more copies came off press, the ink's visual nature often changed too, gradually reducing copies in their original vibrancy of the bluish or purple inks that we're familiar with, fading as the paper they were printed on was exposed to light over time. As if to re-emphasize or to emphasize their visual deterioration, it has often been said that the inks that were used smelled of rotten fish. Fanzines are graphic objects. They expand to be active as agents for documenting social, political, and cultural histories. Graphic objects are able to hold memories and commit to print their producers' personal stories, explored in text and made visible through a shared language and understanding. Fanzines were made predominantly by individuals or small collectives, and more often than not, created for personal rather than financial reasons. They formed part of a cultural economy, rather than integrated into art world markets as amateur publications, or at least the ones that I'm interested in exploring. And I don't know how well you can see this, but I'll, I'll read a bit from it in a second. So this is an example of a letter from a comic zine called The Comics, produced by John Wright in South Africa in the early 1960s. It demonstrates the way in which creators were able to reach out to networks of enthusiasts who equally shared in their passions for the subject. In this case, the writing of fan fiction based on comic book characters. Wright was a radio enthusiast and also an author of pulp novels, mainly writing under pseudonyms such as Wade Wright, uh, in which he did a series of crime th uh, thriller novels, and under Ray Nolan, uh, where he looked at the kind of Western genre. The comics ran for only two issues, and then uh, was the first scene to be also issued outside of the US, and he had a US agent, uh, even just for those two issues, but quite important in terms of extending uh, the uh, audience for his uh, particular writings and those of other collaborators on the zine. So it was a forum for publishing for authors and also for uh, certain kinds of writing collaborations. And John Wright comments in his editorial notice, uh, which is held in the middle of the publication, that his hope that the story will have provided you with some entertainment. So he was quite interested in not just providing uh, an opportunity for the, the authors to have a space for writing, but also for the audience to uh, have some enjoyment, some pleasure out of the uh, text that they were reading. And so he says, even more, it is hoped that you will let us have some of your work. So again, he's soliciting uh, other texts and other writers uh, to, to come join him on the, the publication. And he says, if you don't have a complete story to tell, then send us your idea and we will collaborate on it. And I think this is quite nice because in a way, this is kind of an underlying feature of a lot of the fanzine publications, that it's about reaching out uh, into the shared communities, as many of uh, you have already said, uh, John, uh, in terms of your talk as well. So this particular uh, letter, I, is, it, is it too difficult for you to see or do you want to read out a few bits of it? You okay with that? Yeah, okay. Um, again, I think it's really interesting that this is, this is a smaller sheet that was inserted into the main publication. Uh, so obviously somebody can pull it out, uh, keep it even if they pass on the fanzine so that they knew how to get in touch with John and to um, extend some of those uh, ideas about their writings. And this is another page uh, from the publication. So this is um, the last page of a article um, or a, a short kind of feature story which uh, the author wrote about the history and critiquing the work of a 1939 uh, costume superhero called Blue Beetle. And the particular piece was called The Murder Case of the Blue Beetle by James Corral. And it was first uh, drawn in an iteration by Charles Nicholas, and then there were different versions of how the character changed from uh, the very beginning of, of um, the character's lifespan in the 1940s uh, all the way up through uh, 1948 with subsequent iterations. And so um, the author has reproduced those uh, in his own hand to kind of show the differences in how the mask changes uh, throughout. So a bit of historical writing um, going inside as well with um, some of the other text about superheroes. 
Now, this is one of my, my favorite uh, publications from this period. It's um, Heroes Unlimited, produced by Paul Neri, and this is from 1967. And it was one of the first comic scenes outside of the US encouraging communication between fans and uh, the producers, which was Paul and Anthony Roche. The black and white covers of these zines also provided a chance to um, subsequently add to it this layer of coloring, and as we've uh, seen earlier in terms of the washes that are being included, to give it some vibrancy, uh, some added life. And when you turn the uh, inside, uh, or the, the cover open and look at the inside, and it's too fragile to photograph, so I'm, I'm sorry I don't have a, um, an image of it, but it actually identifies that the color is by a particular individual. So the credit being given to um, those uh, contributing to the issue as well. In the editorial of this particular issue, Neri suggests that the cover of the next issue will be produced in lithography. He writes, always, as always, we are striving for quality. We want the reader to gain the full effect from any art we present. What this means exactly is that the artist's drawing will be reproduced clearly and professionally, just as he drew it. He goes on to explain to the readers that this will incur additional costs for the magazine and that he will have to raise the price of the subscription by three pence. And he goes on to apologize for that, but he guarantees that the quality will uh, increase uh, with the subsequent issues. So, fast forward to 1976. Tony Drayton was 18 when he started the publication Ripped and Torn that ran from November 1976 for 18 issues until 1979. The title of the fanzine was a tribute to the Texan actor Rip Torn, one of the main stars of Nicholas Rogue's film The Man Who Fell to Earth, starring David Bowie. Drayton remembers, quote, Rip and Torn is a funny name. Ripped and Torn is a description of usable goods. The skid, or, who was also his kind of alter um, ego, uh, and also a contributor to his own publication, uh, thought it was quite funny to actually uh, call him after Rip and Torn. Produced in Glasgow when Drayton was working in an advertising agency, Rip and Torn was printed on a photocopier. After Drayton moved to London, the fanzine was taken to a printer in Cambridge, where the increase in print run necessitated printing offset litho. The name of the fanzine also summed up a certain kind of punk DIY aesthetic, made visible by the technique of collage and cut out text. Significantly, it was also indicated an attitude towards the materiality of the graphic object itself, as being physically ripped and torn, and therefore having its very value diminished. The punk movement, too, was ripped, in the sense that it provided participants a forum for a witty and vehement critique on commodity culture, conformity, poor social conditions, and feelings of alienation. Now, Ripped and Torn became notable for its style. It was always political and took a, a stance um, on anti-fascism. Like other fanzines during this period, and I show uh, two here, Sniffing Glue and Panache, a re recognizable visual aesthetic emerged that was raw, edgy, and seemingly chaotic, mostly as a response to the punk do-it-yourself ethos but also as a result of the way that producers were using mainly lo-fi production and printing techniques. There was an immediacy of the message reflected in the throwaway quality of its production and the process of recycling materials from mainstream magazines. As one scholar has suggested, the tactile use of recycled materials also suggests temporality of sorts as materials and meanings move from one context to another. Drayton used photographs from music magazines such as Sounds and the NME, as well as the cartoon strip panels taken out of context. He used uh, work of other photographers, mainly publicity photos. And uh, those were often sourced from record companies. But then he also started using work of freelance photographers, uh, many of whom would later become significant in the documentaries, uh, documentation of the punk scene. Uh, such as Walt Davidson, Jill Formaniski, and Jim Gibbs. The ironic use of images would appear in the pinup poster page of the fanzine, dedicated to an individual singer, such as Alternative TV, The Clash, Paulina Penetration, and so forth. 
Now, there are early issues of Ripped and Torn, and I've put two here. One is uh, number four, and then a later publication, <clears throat> uh, two years later, number 14, to give you a sense of uh, how Tony was beginning to use the technologies that were available to him uh, in the creation of the, uh, the, the covers, at least, for these zines. And they were usually photocopied in ways that fixed the chaotic nature of the page layout, comprised of cut and paste media collages and hand and typewritten text, replete with the obligatory mistakes and crossouts. Now Drayton emphasizes the DIY nature of this publication, remarking that it was just whatever we could lay our hands on at the time. All the scoring out and the, the various crosses or X's that were used weren't a pose, they were the real thing. It was the only way we knew. Unlike other fancies at the time, Drayton didn't, for example, use Letraset in the production process, despite the common use of the rub-down lettering in the Glasgow Advertising Agency uh, graphic design department where he worked. This he attributes to differences of musical taste projected by his co-workers, who were more fans of Glasgow's Celtic rock band JSD, rather than fans of punk rock. The consequence was a lack of access to the facilities and materials found in the graphic design department. So I think, John, as you were referring to, these different kind of factions, uh, and this in the case of, uh, of the advertising agency. Handwritten text was the mainstay of his typographic treatment using black marking pens. This approach was important to Drayton, who suggested that we were often writing down directly what we felt. The concept of rewriting anything wasn't to emerge until later uh, and in later editions. Such an immediacy was not only significant in forming part of what became a key stylistic characteristic of the fanzine, but also in the way in which handwritten forms left the producer's mark in the production process. The invisible spirit was made visible and its very materiality shared with other like-minded anarchists and enthusiasts. So this wasn't lost on Drayton, whose own hand is still evident despite his use of mechanical reproduction provided by typewriters that he had used on loan from friends and family. In some of the issues, uh, he talks about the pages being typed out and that he could actually recognize the machines of the time in, in retrospect. So his mother's typewriter machine was one that he used. Um, another time, um, he used a professional journalist uh, typewriter. So again, he's going around and using what's available to him. Um, so despite this kind of mechanistic nature of the typewriter uh, as uh, uh, in contrast to kind of his handwritten work. They kind of uh, revealed the typewriters themselves, their own kind of idiosyncratic characteristics, which became embedded in the fanzine page. Some had keys that got stuck, uh, which left spaces, individual characters were inked in, and the inevitable mistake of hitting the wrong keystroke when typing was maintained as part of that aesthetic. So in keeping with the spirit of punk, and as if to provide his kind of two fingers up to the agency which kept Drayton free access, or, or gave Drayton um, the free access to facilities, he managed to photocopy the first 100 copies of Ripped and Torn by sneaking into the agency's photocopier. But Drayton doesn't hold any grudges. He remarks years later that had I been allowed to be more creative in my employment, perhaps Ripped and Torn would never have existed. These copies were later compiled and made up into 10 copies of the fanzine to send down to Rough Trade and Compendium Books, both important independent London venues where punk fanzines and other anarchist materials were distributed. The first 12 issues had single-sided pages, with later issues running up to an average around 20 pages. The first issue was produced in Glasgow with a print run of 510 copies. Later issues averaged around 3,000 copies, with the exception of issue 11, which Drayton noted was increased to around 10,000 copies. Now, this is quite significant in terms of fanzine production when that tended to be quite lower runs uh, of the publication. Now, Drayton reduced the print run thereafter as part of a purely pragmatic decision. He explains, I couldn't be bothered with the hassle of organizing distribution and sales of the larger print runs. By issue three, Drayton's position at the agency was actually nebulous, and by issue four, he had been sacked, moved, moving to London, where he continued to document and provoke readers through his fanzine. 
Now, Ripped and Torn was distributed in part on the streets, but also through the mail order services of Rough Trade, Compendium, and other independent book and clothing stores, which included Vinyl Solution in Portobello Road, Kitch 22 on the King's Road, and so forth. The rest of the issues were sold at punk band gigs where Drayton remembers that I would take a bag full and sell them direct. This form of distribution brought the fanzine attempt back to the original source and continued to feed back into the punk scene. As Drayton reflects, you had no idea that this was going to be an art. This was important. You just had to get something out. Punk rock was taking shape on the pages of fanzines like Ripped and Torn. And here's a couple of more examples, again, showing an earlier issue with a later edition uh, of him having a little bit more money to get uh, color involved on the color. So finally, it's impossible to talk about Ripped and Torn without saying a little more about its politics, which were fierce. The fanzine took an anarchist line on events, which meant being anti-big business, anti-fascist, and pro-causes such as gay liberation, squatters' rights, women's liberation, and so forth. However, these politics were nuanced, and Drayton could be highly critical of the party line. Also, his support of causes did not, help, uh, did not stop him from being critical of some of the records, for example, that he uh, actually reviewed uh, from the music scenes. So how do we bring this back to the ephemeral, ephemeral graphic object? The intended temporal nature of Ripped and Torn and other punk fanzines is also understood through its visual display and production processes. These seemingly hurried use of chaotic layouts, collage techniques, hand scrawled typography, use of rub down lettering, and so forth. The visualness has its own materiality. As jo Joanna Drucker in her book, The Visible Word, uh, attempts to explain is that she sees a paradox taking place between language, writing, and signification to history. She writes, there can be no separation of writing any instance of inscription from the material conditions of its existence. A dialectical relationship occurs between the text as type in this case and the material form itself, A4 photocopied paper bound together by a single staple where its production process becomes an integral part of the presentation of written text. So for example, the word is written fuck is shaped by the resulting degradation of broken up letter forms created by the photocopy or printing press, or indeed the typewriter itself in terms of the closed up keys. This becomes a typographic performance and highlights an interesting, if not provocative, statement about the punk DIY culture and attitudes, while at the same time imposing a linguistic authority. Now, fancies are handmade and tangible, and they're passed from one person to another, and the knowledge that some kind of communication is taking place. Meaning is enhanced through materiality, and this is expressed through the physicality of the fanzine, whether paper, scale, bindings, format, etc., are used. The linguist Ron Scallion describes this as mediational, that is, the process by which human interconnectedness is achieved not just through the direct contact of people's bodies, but also through external forms, media in the widest sense. It could be argued that in our case, ripped and torn as an ephemeral graphic object becomes the physical link between Drayton as a producer and his readership. The politics of ripped and torn as described above were obviously a huge part of this. So in terms of a history of fanzines, this process of archiving or collecting introduces a tension between what was intended to be thrown away, graphic objects capturing fleeting moments of time, and in a context of permanent or fixed archival materials. In this way, the materiality of the object is put into question as it becomes collected, reproduced, and analyzed. Taking this in, into account, I would now like to end on the question, what happens to any understanding of fanzines when they move onto an online repository? The debate between the digital and the physical materiality of objects is nothing new. One is often understood in opposition to the other in the way that it can, in the way that it can be considered a threat to an established cultural practice. Ripped and Torn has transformed from a material graphic object into one that is digital, scanned, and uploaded as thumbnails, available to view in the format of a slideshow. All the covers and interior pages of its three-year run are archived and available to view on Drayton's website and online archive. The site is powered by WordPress and is still a work in progress. 
Drayton has opted for a visually clean approach with a generous use of white space and conventional default typefaces. The first issue of Ripped and Torn floats spatially on top of a collection, cropped, uh, floats spatially on top of another cropped collection of another zine that he wrote called Kill Your Pet Puppy, which ran from 1979 to 1983, and which has a decidedly different approach to its aesthetic. This in itself provides a visual study of the typefaces and hand-drawn letter forms that Drayton used for the title of the fanzine in order to convey the different approaches to its DIY nature. Drayton has used other memorabilia sparsely throughout this site. He is not an, ar he is not an archivist wallowing in, a, in nostalgic reflection. Rather, Drayton supplies these graphic objects as evidence in order to verify his historical narrative. For example, an envelope and accompanying letter from the editor Mark Perry of Sniff and Glue um, illustrates Perry's ambivalent attitude toward Drayton and his fanzine. Like an object for forensic investigation, the letter is carefully laid out flat and photographed on a white background. This enhances its apparent fragility. However, as you read Perry's scrawled note, oops, sorry about the rips and tears, the physical rips and tears, with sellotape edges are thrown into question. This is Perry's satirical take on the fanzine's title by playing on the materiality of the letter itself. Clearly, what is at stake here is the past, or rather accounts of the past. It is about whose narrative to believe, and it is about what is the true narrative of punk. In setting up a website in this way, Drayton is putting forward a point of view of what happened in those years. At the same time, he's fully aware that this point of view clashes with that of others. As I have shown throughout this very brief uh, series of examples, the question as to what is duplication and what is being duplicated still has relevance today for us as his historians and producers. And what of the enhancement of digital printing technologies in the future, we might ask? Siskin points out that the fact that writing can physically render the real is an important fact about the physical experience of reality. This experience triggers an understanding of how fanzines are interpreted and what this might mean to a producer. The rough and ready and ephemeral materiality of the printed zine, the tactility of the paper, and the way the ink sits on the surface is seemingly lost as the process of transforming the physical artifact into a dematerialized digital form occurs. Yet, not all is lost. As Catherine N. Hales has remarked as a result of this process, we may come to renewed appreciation for the specificity of print. Thank you. And many thanks, uh, Tiltrix, for the really fascinating talk. Uh, it's great to open up then, beginning to open up questions relating to the graphic language of duplication, which I think uh, there's, there's, there's so much within that. So to open up uh, questions, anybody having any questions? Yeah, Rob? Looks like everybody's ready for lunch. Not so much a question, it's just a follow-up bit of information for you. The fanzine Heroes Unlimited um, ran for seven issues. Uh, Tony Roach went on to become professor of English at a university in uh, Dublin. Um, and he recently published issue eight, 50 years after the last issue, which uh -huh. is now available um, online. Um, his earlier fanzine, which was called the Mary Marvel Fanzine, who owns the joint title of being the first comics fanzine published on this side of the Atlantic. The joint title is with um, a fanzine called Kapow that yes. came out of Birmingham. Uh, it was edited by um, Steve Moore and somebody else whose name I've forgotten. Um, following Steve's death, I, I, I managed to get access to his um, fanzine collection. Uh, I was able to pass along the copies of Heroes Unlimited. He still had to Anthony Roach, who lost his many, many years ago. So Anthony Roach is still around, and in fact, Heroes Unlimited 8. It had a limited um, print run, but it's now available online for those who want to see it. Yeah, great, thank you. I had an issue of Kapow up here, and I thought, no, I could, I could keep putting lots of images up here, but I needed to, to yeah. take it out. But yeah, it, Kapow itself is just amazing, absolutely we, fantastic. Weirdly enough, the artwork still exists for the first two issues. I currently have possession of it because I'm scanning it, but I'll be passing it back to the uh, current owner eventually. Yeah. Do you have any other questions? Yeah. 
Uh, that under the current circumstances, there may be a musical movement that will return uh, to the fanzine. I mean, is there? I don't know in my uh, in my knowledge whether there's hip hop uh, duplicated magazines or stuff like that. Whether you'd come across um, later examples uh, allied to a particular musical style. Um, yeah, I have come across later examples when um, producers get interested in looking back at the technologies and then they kind of revisit that and pull it back into a contemporary context. Yeah. Um, so very much so. I think um, what I'm seeing over the last few years, and in a way I stopped collecting fanzines about maybe eight years ago, um, primarily of a, a, a storage decision, as, as you've experienced, as I think all of us probably in the room have good collections. Um, but also the kind of knowingness of the producer seems to have shifted in terms of what's actually being produced. And it's taking on a different form, uh, which is, is, is not incorrect. It's what this generation of particularly art school students are now engaging with and using them as uh, mouthpieces for their own work or for other kind of causes that they're interested in. So it's, it's the next generation has started and I just couldn't collect everything. Um, but I think the, the kind of trajectory of uh, things that have gone from the science fiction fanzines, the comic zines, through punk and so forth, there is a, a, a changing aesthetic now uh, and it is, it's very knowing about the technologies uh, and using those to quite sophisticated levels within these publications. And it's just something that, you know, I had to put a stop to. But yes, all sorts of interesting things are happening though. Yeah. Uh, I actually have a question. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit maybe about the differing politics within the, the aesthetic between the wax stencil and the electric stencil. So I was thinking a lot about, obviously it's a different period often. Um, a lot of people that have worked with duplicators often today may have just worked with the electric stencil. I know that uh, Bob Hansen produced a fanzine that was just working with uh, the electric scanner. And we do a lot of work also with the wax stencils. And I was wondering if you could speak a bit about the. I was wondering if the wax stencil, which maybe lends itself more to kind of really delicate work uh, because of the medium, maybe difference, differs somehow politically from the, the electric stencil, which is something maybe perhaps more rapid, um, enabling these kind of punk uh, fanzines. Yeah, I mean, we were talking about this earlier, that I think uh, that idea of kind of slowing down processes and really embedding the kind of um, the, the hand in those processes, the early processes, does give it a, a different kind of sensation, um, that the, 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 the very rapid immediacy of the Xerox machine uh, creating something which you know people are just throwing loads of stuff together and putting it on the machine and letting it, it go in terms of that collage aesthetic does have a very different feel to uh, what even though in those comic scenes the covers a very considered uh, kind of drawing style um, so yeah you could you could say that technologies is um, you know doing something in terms of the aesthetic from from that standpoint I wouldn't want to say that's the only thing that's happening because obviously the content um, and the different producers having a different way of thinking through how they're visualizing or at least uh, representing um, some of the ideas that they have politically comes into play as well. So it, it doesn't always mean one thing is one way and another is another way, but sometimes it does that as well. But yeah, I think the kind of considered aspects of it is important, yeah. Thank you, is there one more question? So the comic fanzine is a, um, it's something new to me and really exciting. Is it simply just people making fanzines about comics that they like, or is there more to it than that? I, the, the ones that I've been looking at in terms of comic zines, uh, like other fanzines, are coming from an enthusiast position that they are looking at. Uh, during the 60s, it tended to be the kind of superheroes that were coming forward, but they would all have their, you know, individual kind of favorite uh, superhero that they were looking at. Some of these others were um, not only looking at the superheroes, but they were actually talking about the history of comics as well and, the, and uh, highlighting the various artists and producers that were working on zines. So it became a really interesting document in terms of it wasn't 
just someone creating something that they were a fan about in terms of the superhero, but it was everything that went around it as well. So they are quite interesting in terms of contextualizing what people were thinking about, what they were looking at, and who was doing what, and, and so forth. And I suspect Rob's talk will look at that, particularly in the science fiction community. We're kind of all, that all got started there in terms of uh, kind of the history of, but happening within these publications. Around 1930s. Yeah. Okay, so many thanks once again, uh, Tiltrix, for a really great talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. much.